everyone uh, coming to attend this talk. Uh, I'm Paul Coggin from uh, Huntsville, Alabama in the U.S. Uh, this is my fourth time uh, speaking at X33FCon. I, I sincerely appreciate the invitation to return. I have uh, came in to uh, Poland a few days early and got to uh, visit Sopod and uh, Gdansk. I love this country. It is so beautiful. The Baltic Sea area is just uh, breathtaking. Fabulous people, great food. I love to eat, and I ate a lot while I was here. It's uh, it's been really, really great visit and a uh, fun time being back here in Poland again. So this talk, I'm going to uh, get into some ideas uh, around threat hunting for uh, both uh, space and uh, digital energy. The genesis of this talk were years ago, where I when I first started thinking about this subject. Uh, my kids were making me watch the Transformers movie over and over and over. And uh, being an IT computer security nerd, I was thinking, you know, how would someone detect uh, a sophisticated attack like the Decepticons, uh, where they're embedded themselves like in a satellite or uh, the Air Force One and the other computer systems that were getting attacked? Uh, they were so hard to detect what they were doing, how they got in, et cetera. And around that same time, there was all the activity in the news about uh, around the uh, Stuxnet attack against the uh, centrifuges in the Iran nuclear program. And so I was starting to think, really uh, was puzzling me, how would we go and detect these sophisticated attacks that the normal IT security monitoring is not detecting and is missing? My initial thoughts being an old school network guy, because I come my background, my basically network engineering, I came up through ne telco service provider enterprise networking. So, so I like I was always uh, thinking about you know as an as an old school router guy, how would we go and attack this and detect it? And so I started thinking about in band and out of band data management, uh, collecting all the logs both in band and out of band, and correlating the logs is looking for differences, uh, you know, from the environment, et cetera. But as uh, my, my thoughts matured more, uh, I started realizing, you know, that's not enough. I need to go deeper. And so I, I spent, spent a lot of my career also working in smart grid, industrial control systems, SCADA. Now everybody calls it operational technology, Internet of Things, et cetera, whatever the marketing buzzword uh, that the vendors are selling this week. But uh, but, but brought me back to this Purdue model. To, uh, to describe how to maybe look at some of these problems differently that are being missed in the critical infrastructure and some of the large enterprises. And that's going down to, to the lower level, down to the physical systems, looking at things like uh, electrical signals to different sensors, vibration, actuators, measuring current draw, get as low level as we can out of band so that there's no external influences to this uh, data. But, but go down as low as we can and, and monitor the signal that's happening and then correlate that with the whole system of system of the normal data that we usually collect with our logging systems to uh, get an idea of what's happening. So, so this presentation is like brainstorming that I did on what are, what are all the data sources that us typical network and IT professionals may be missing that are out there? And I'll tell you one thing I've learned from some uh, some of the professionals uh, that, that that are uh, true experts in industrial control systems and SCADA is there's not a lot of security down here at level zero, level one in those devices, not a lot of authentication happening. It's a uh, pretty insecure, it's pretty unsecure uh, environment when you get down to those levels. Uh, there's standards that are being worked on it for, for level zero, level one, but it's not, most places it's not there yet. So one thing is, uh, is I was making sure that I was not totally off track. I went and uh, looked at the MITRE attack, and they have 39 data sources identified. And again, some of the, what I've kind of confirmed to myself is that go, going and drilling down in the physics-based data sources may be a, a place that's being overlooked that we should go look at is uh, cybersecurity professionals that are trying to find, you know, the Decepticons in the network, uh, that, you know, the proverbial APT that is so hard to fight. So, so my, 
a lot of the inspiration I got to go back and revisit this is I'm working on my fourth master's in space systems, which is basically physics. And, and as I was digging into all of this physics for uh, the space systems, uh, academic work I'm doing, I saw, you know, how would these physicists go about attacking the problem? Because the way that I think about it, and, you know, a lot of peers in the network industry, we're obviously missing something. So how, you know, how would uh, the physicists go about it? And what would Newton and Einstein do? How would they think about it? Uh, so, so one, one example of a sensor, low-cost sensor, if we were in a critical infrastructure environment, maybe go and uh, uh, look at something like a vibration sensor to collect logging information from. They like uh, those, uh, for example, those Iranian centrifuges back in the day when they were spinning and uh, the current was fluctuating, the centrifuge, the speed was changing in those centrifuges. There's probably was some vibration, there's probably some current draw changes. And if, they, if there was like a vibration sensor on that, maybe that would have uh, detected it. So also maybe some of our other critical infrastructure environments, maybe a gas pipeline, uh, what have you. Maybe if we had a vibration sensor monitoring those uh, critical infrastructure networks, maybe that would give the, the um, security monitoring team, the threat hunting team, some new key data. Uh, Something I found a real interesting idea is acoustic monitoring. Uh, you could uh, monitor the acoustics of, say, the pipes and uh, look and listen for, uh, for, for different variations in the sounds that you're hearing in, say, your pipes. Also, in power transformers, a lot, there's a lot of talk about the power grid being a target for uh, nation state uh, entities. That if, that, uh, that, that if the critical infrastructure is going to be targeted, the power grid obviously is a big target. Well, what about looking at power transformers? Apparently, I'm not an electrical engineer and don't work in the power industry. Uh, this, but apparently, uh, the power, some of the power transformers have oil in them, and it is uh, a, a good point of uh, data source to listen to the sound, the harmonics of the uh, transformers that are filled with oil, because apparently they'll make different noises and then you could either maybe uh, predict a maintenance issue. You could forecast, hey, we need to be prepared to replace a transformer that's starting to fail. Or it could be an indicator for a threat hunt team that works for that, that power grid provider. Hey, we, we may have somebody helping us manage the network. We might need to go and investigate this further, both with the maintenance team and with uh, cyber SMEs to correlate this data to make sure that it's not a maintenance problem, or we have a sophisticated attack against our power transformer. So it's another good data indicator to look at. Um, harmonics from the current. Apparently, uh, you can. It's possible to study the the current that is being drawn by computer systems and detect the software that's being run. Maybe that is a a way to to consider for threat hunt teams to be able to detect malware that is running on uh, targeted systems in, in uh, key critical infrastructure, to detect software that we're not aware of, that's totally outside of configuration management and control, something that's not in our inventory, maybe, uh, maybe monitoring the harmonics and, and baselining that out of the, the uh, current utilization is a uh, new indicator that if we correlated the whole big system of systems into our logs, and applied like machine learning to it, and baseline that, we could uh, find that anomaly, that needle in the haystack, by looking at this harmonics metric. Oh. And this was really fascinating to me as a uh, physics-based data source. Everyone is talking about P&T in the news. I follow a lot of uh, industry experts in the space industry, and they talk about uh, the timing, GPS, GNSS, all the timing sources with satellites. Now, I had... It's fascinating to me that the power grid is very dependent on timing to sync up uh, the timing between all, all the different uh, transmission systems so that they can accurately reroute power. And if the timing is off, power starts getting routed the wrong way, bad things are going to happen. It's going to cause, uh, it could cause major interruptions in the grid if timing is not totally synced up against the whole uh, power grid system. And a lot of the systems use NTP, network time protocol, might use uh, GPS sensors to uh, pull accurate timing, but 
but in but but GPS can be spoofed. It's in the news regularly now that GPS is being spoofed, so that can be targeted by jamming or spoofing. Uh, and of course, NTP. There's been some denial of service attacks against NTP. So we need to go and look at back uh, backups for the uh, the GPS systems and uh, NTP. No, the NTP is being moved to uh, precision timing protocol. It's more accurate. But there are other alternatives like the celsium and, and rubidium uh, oscillators uh, the, and some other satellites that we can monitor. But the threat hunting team definitely needs to be monitoring the timing sources, wherever they're pulling that timing sync from, need to be monitoring that for variations to make sure someone is not targeting timing, trying to disrupt the power grid system or the network that they're monitoring. So, this is a this is a, a key place to go and monitor. Because I know, in my experience working in with uh, power companies, everyone is work is everybody's uh, doing what everybody does. We monitor the firewall logs. You're watching the server logs, your SCADA logs, your HMI logs. But what about the power? Making sure that power and uh, putting putting uh, logging capability to sync up and keep an eye on your power. A key thing not to uh, lose sight of. Uh, again, going back to uh, some of the satellite system attacks that we may be overlooking, uh, like GPS, et cetera, uh, is the uh, satellite control system that, for the user segment that goes on uh, ships. There's been a lot of activity where from uh, the satellite system that, for, that the communications on the ships utilized for navigation, being able to talk back to, uh, to the owners of the ships. And there's typically uh, an organization that will be managing ships or uh, different organizations that keep up with all the traffic routes and what is, you know, what's going on with the weather, et cetera. Third party organizations, kind of like a knock sock for ships that is taking care of all the logistics and management of the ships that they'll come in over SATCOMs to help uh, the captains manage the ship. In many cases, the captains are responsible for the ship, but there's other organizations that are telling the captains exactly what to do, where they're gonna navigate, and how to traverse the seas, you know, to make sure that they don't run aground or run into weather issues. But, but, it's, show, but it's showing here that, uh, that coming in over those satellite links, the navigation systems and all are being targeted. And so those systems need to be monitored all of the different physics-based navigation systems on the ship should be monitored to make sure somebody hasn't come in over a SATCOM link and is helping us drive the ship. In this case, uh, there was a German ship that was headed to uh, Djibouti uh, over a, near uh, Kenya off the east coast of Africa. And uh, the, the pirates had uh, one of the ships hacked for like 10 hours, had control of them, were steering it. Uh, and also from the, from the theme of this presentation about physics-based monitoring, it was released uh, that some classified data was released that the Iranians were researching how to make a ship blow up. That's going to go back to physics-based monitoring. They're trying to go and figure out how to make uh, you know a, something kinetic happen through a, a cyber attack. Say so maybe blowing up a pump, blowing you know making a centrifuge fail, maybe blowing up a pump at a fuel station. They need to put an emphasis on physics-based monitoring on these ships. Uh, another incident happened uh, not too, just a few years ago. Apparently, there was a ship coming out headed to uh, New York uh, that uh, had gotten gotten hacked and got taken over. And got in, in the uh, hack. The, the, the folks who uh, targeted the ship had complete control of the uh, navigational system and were able to drive the ship. And apparently, according to this Cyber Owl Consulting Company. They're saying that they're seeing at least one attack against ships a day. So those ships are getting targeted through the satellite communication system and down into the navigational control system that, that drive the ship. And that's going to be a bunch of physics-based uh, devices, you know, uh, gyroscopes, et cetera, that are on those ships that should be getting monitored, that we should be collecting data on to know what's happening with our ship. Not just monitoring, you know, the Windows server, but also monitoring those up, those uh, 
those ILT operational technology uh, devices on the ship. There's been a great deal of, of uh, talk about GPS spoofing, especially with the war going on in Ukraine. It's been going on for a long time, uh, GPS spoofing. It's, it's in the news a, a great deal here recently. Uh, in, in a lot of cases, what the GPS spoofing is doing that we're reading about is uh, it's trying to defeat drones. If, uh, if you can confuse the drones, you might be able to make a drone e either land or return back to base. If, uh, if it's getting outside of uh, where, where it knows it's supposed to be, if it's getting confused, it'll just fly back home. And you, can, you can get GPS uh, receivers that are hardened but those GPS receivers that are hardened are not going to tell you who's attacking you. If you, if, you, if you want to set up the ability to identify where the attack is coming from, not just try to protect the, the device, but also identify it. As threat hunters, you're going to need to have additional antennas that can not only uh, receive the signal, detect the signal that the GPS is being targeted and, and uh, protect, protect uh, say, a ship, or a UAV drone device from it, but also you're going to need multiple additional antennas to be able to detect the direction the attack is coming from, if that is of interest to you. Uh, another uh, sort of physics-based source to consider, uh, going back to ships, is the echo sounder. That would be a good target for a terrorist organization because that echo sounder on a ship uh, is going to tell the ship how deep of water they're in whether they're about to go and maybe get up on a sandbar or a reef. You know, maybe, and I've got an example here of a pristine reef that a ship doesn't know that it was about to run aground, that, that it was off course for like four days until it ran up on a pristine uh, reef. Uh, so maybe some, somebody was messing with the navigation system and uh, the nautical, the maps were not showing that they were where they thought they were as well as the echo sounder was not telling them that they were starting to run into shallow water and run up on a reef. So I'll have an example of that. Another uh, device we'll be looking at is uh, the anemometer for uh, monitoring wind. There is a issue in the Suez Canal not too long ago. There's a lot of speculation about what happened there. There is uh, speculation that uh, there was a couple of pilots and the captains were maybe of, uh, arguing on the bridge about who, was, who had authority to drive the ship through the canal. There's, specul there's speculation, uh, that there was speculation about a cyber attack. Uh, and there's also uh, some thought that what might have happened is in that part of the world where the Suez Canal is, uh, it could have been wind. So my, my question is, is uh, so were the wind sensors being monitored? Or were they being influenced? If it was a cyber attack, were, were they collecting the logs off those wind sensors? Did they have a baseline of that to know there's a you know what kind of anomaly might be happening? Uh, but that was that was in the news for a long time. There they had the whole canal blocked. But that is a key instrument to also look at at monitoring the health and status of not only for for maintenance and making sure you're not in, experiencing issues due to the wind, but also from a possible someone having a, a cybersecurity attack to influence the vessel. Another uh, device to consider uh, for getting physics-based logs from is the accelerometer, where uh, it's a device that's going to measure acceleration. Uh, and so that mechanical motion is going to be turned into an electrical signal. And so we, so as threat hunters, as cybersecurity professionals, it's our job to monitor these type of vessels, whether it's a satellite or a ship, what have you. Uh, we should be, maybe consider monitoring that mechanical to electrical signal that is being generated and have that baseline and uh, adding that to uh, our logging and applying machine learning to it over time so that we can detect those possible anomalies. Or it could be, again, going back, it could be that we could proactively predict a maintenance issue and deal with the problem before it uh, you know, turns into a really big expensive issue or a possible catastrophe because we're being proactive in monitoring. Not every problem is a cyber attack. Uh, so, so it could be that it enables you know, proactive maintenance 
But if it isn't, if it is a cyber attack, we'll at least have maybe have a uh, early warning. So uh, and then we got a gyroscope, very similar nature, uh, where, where we're going to keep up with our orientation, our speed. We're going to have these on our uh, space on a uh, space vehicle, satellites, uh, space station, also on ships, whether it's a uh, military ship or cruise ships, uh, you know, cargo ships, et cetera, they're going to have gyroscopes. That's going to be a key device to monitor and get instrumentation on for the threat hunt team to know what's going on with that vessel to see if someone's influencing the operation of the vehicle. could be on a drone as well. And uh, speaking of all these uh, physics-based indicators on ships, there's a thing called a voyage data recorder. And it's kind of, voyage data recorder is kind of like a black box for ships. Uh, you know, you've got the black box on planes. Well, ships have something similar called the uh, voyage data recorder. And my thought is, if I work in the, if I worked for a cruise line or uh, if I worked for a military or some cargo ship organization in the future, I would want to have a uh, voyage data recorder for my network cybersecurity team, so that they, so that they could, they're getting a independent, pristine copy of all the instrumentation data from all the operational technology on that ship, the navigation system, the gyroscopes, all the uh, electrical, mechanical to electrical signaling that's happening on that ship. I'd want to have my own vo voyage data recorder that my uh, security operations center, my threat hunters could be monitoring to pull independent pristine logs to uh, be able to, you know, figure if somebody's helping me run my ship. Because here, here is a uh, example of uh, this Wakashio ship that ran aground. And apparently for four days, there were two monitoring systems. There was the owners of the ship that monitored the ship and then there's a third party that monitors and manages ships for the owners. And like I said, they work with uh, the captains and apparently those organizations have more control and authority than the captain on the ship about, how, about where the ship is going, the speed, the, you know, how, how, the direction they're taking based on weather, uh, et cetera. In both of those networks that are monitoring the health status, monitoring location of those ships, Apparently, they had bad data for four days, and nobody knew what really was going on with that ship until it ran aground up on a pristine reef. Uh, so that goes back to, you know, from a threat hunting standpoint, as cybersecurity professionals, we, we need to be able to have a, v, a voyage data recorder access of our own so that the threat hunters can be pulling this data and correlating it with enterprise-type data to uh, get a baseline of what's happening with the network. Uh, this goes back to my uh, where where I've spent most of my years uh, as a professional in, in uh, teleco telecommunication service provider networks, and I, I I presented on this a few years ago, about four years ago, about hacking telecommunication service provider networks. But, so, but, but since we're talking about physics-based detection, I wanted to bring this back up. It's not talked a lot about, especially the telecommunications companies don't want it. They don't want to talk about the fact that their networks get hacked like everybody else's do, and there's insider threats. There's nation states that are targeting their networks. There's organized crime that are targeting their networks uh, as well. But we just treat it like, you know, the cloud. It's a black box to us. Don't think of but BGP is being hijacked. If, you, if you're not aware of it, you need to be watching and monitoring your BGP. But also, if you're, if you're buying services like multi-protocol label switching, which a lot, of, uh, a lot of us in the enterprise world treat as a black box uh, network, and we just don't ask any questions. The telco tells us it's secure. They, they use the acronym, you know, VPN. So everybody assumes that that implies encryption, but it doesn't. It's just a, uh, it's just a layer two, layer three unencrypted VPN. It's, it's not encrypted until you lay encryption on it. So, so you could very well uh, either have uh, someone, an insider threat that works for the telco or, or nation state actor. I've, I'm aware of multiple cases of each. Can't go into them for NDAs, obviously, but I'm aware of uh, multiple cases. 
where, where these networks are being targeted and the enterprises uh, accidentally find out about it. And like one, one organization, they called some IP addresses out of uh, an interesting part of the world coming in from their MPLS VPN is secure. It's secure because it's VPN, right? But there is uh, from their public, private, uh, rather their private VPN service, there is uh, traffic ex exfiltrating out their firewall, and they didn't recognize, recognize the IP addresses, and they tracked it back, and the telco MPLS VPN network had been hacked, and some adversary had added themselves to their MPLS VPN. And then, of course, there's a lot of uh, conversations on the Internet about uh, BGP hacking. But I want to throw out the idea that a way to, one way to detect this, if you don't have good visibility, is timing. You, even if you're on the enterprise side, if you're out on the edge of a telecommunications carrier network, you're not sure what's happening with the telco. You can't hide from physics. And time is going to tell the truth. If you've got a baseline of what your connectivity looks like to your remote locations, uh, you know, say across Poland, across Europe, uh, Asia, the U.S., South America, the Pacific, et cetera, if you have good baseline of that, you can you can be able to go and indicate that someone is doing like uh, uh, using MPLS traffic re MPLS traffic engineering or something to uh, redirect your traffic down a different path so that they can do capture or possibly injection into uh, your MPLS network or your internet network. So there's something else to uh, consider, and there's a bunch of papers out there on this. This is. Another thing I want to draw your attention to is, uh, is there's, a, there's a big push to put lots of technology out on the military now, you know, both in the U.S. and, of course, uh, here in Europe. Every, everyone is uh, deploying and adding new technology and putting all these specialized sensors and devices on troops as well as uh, emergency responders, adding all kinds of uh, new gadgets and uh, communications devices, but as IT and cybersecurity professionals, we've got to figure out how we're going to uh, threat hunt all these devices, do the forensics and threat hunt and monitor the local system on, a, on an emergency responder or a uh, military personnel. How do we monitor and make sure those devices are not being hacked, that there's some kind of compromise to them uh, with, the whole, with the whole military things and uh, battlefield things? One thing is uh, consider is, is leveraging software-defined radio to monitor all these different protocols that may be getting utilized, like uh, LoRa and LoRaWAN and uh, all the different SATCOM communications. Something that a lot of people are not thinking about. What about the ham radio protocol? It's low speed, not a lot of bandwidth, and and that's a that's an old school protocol. That on more this more seasoned professionals are aware of the ham networks and ham protocols, and a lot of the younger generation are coming up are not aware of the ham networks and don't use it because it's too slow for them, and they're not interested in having uh, voice communications over ham. But ham the ham radio network has the ability to do data communications, and it's it's not going to be high speed. You're not going to be exfilling terabytes of data, but you could be using it for command and control. All you need is a shell, right? What does it stop someone from like taking that slow ham link and uh, using it for uh, backdoor data communications or uh, for command control? Something else to look at. And uh, also keep an eye on this 5G and 6G. 6G, I mean, everybody's talking about it. It's, it's coming with uh, the new satellites, architectures that are uh, about to be deployed. Uh, something else put on your uh, on your radar, if it ain't already, is a whole internet of space things. Uh, SpaceX bought a company called Swarm, and what they're doing is putting in satellites in very low Earth orbit. In very low Earth orbit, those satellites are not going to stay up in orbit for very long because of the atmospheric drag. Because the atmospheric drag is going to pull those satellites out of orbit, and they're going to burn up in the atmosphere after being up there for a short period of time, so it's not going to be a big issue with debris. Things like that, because because uh, where they're located in orbit, they'll just fall out and burn out, and they're small. But there's a, but we need to be th thinking about 
and our plans of how are we going to do uh, forensics and incident response and threat hunting of all these LoRaWAN devices. It's a whole nother, you know, another communication protocol, whole nother uh, set of devices. And I'm having a lot of conversations around these type of devices and, look, and looking at using these communications. And uh, so as threat hunters, we need to be thinking about, you know, how we're going to go and hunt uh, LoRaWAN and uh, in these type of IoT devices. Um, last year, I was here, I, I spoke about uh, some of the uh, satellites that have been hacked, and I'll just hit this real fast. They're, the Landsat 7 was hacked a couple times. It was confirmed it was attacked. Uh, the Terra satellite was uh, targeted. That was confirmed to be an attack. He taken over momentarily. There was a NOAA satellite. NOAA's uh, organization in the U.S. It monitors the atmosphere, the oceans, and things for the U.S., that satellite was attacked uh, successfully, and then control was regained from it. There's debate about the ROSAT. Depending on what camp you're in, there's those that say it wasn't hacked, and they will argue uh, vehemently that there it was not. There was not hacked. And then there's others who say that it really was hacked, and it was directed toward the sun and uh, burned up the uh, the sensor and disabled that satellite. The speculation on the ROSAT is that a uh, ground station was hacked uh, in uh, Europe. About, I think it was by the Russians, is what the speculation is. It was hacked and uh, the satellite was turned, and so it was uh, disabled. But then uh, the UK Skynet satellite, that's one of, Skynet is a UK military satellite network. Four, it's a constellation of four satellites. There's a lot of arguing back and forth about whether that really got hacked or not. I found some pretty good references that said that uh, they didn't admit that the whole satellite was totally taken care of, hacked and, ran, and, and were held for ransom. But they, I did find re references that said that admitted that the control link was taken care of, control of momentarily. So me, I read it got hacked. Uh, but depending on what camp you're in, the argument goes back and forth whether it happened, but I found, but I did find links where it was admitted that the control link was uh, uh, successfully targeted. So we've got to be thinking about threat hunting these satellites and things. And so from a cybersecurity threat hunting standpoint, what are we up against? Well, from a, le from a legacy standpoint, what I've been able to find, there's 23 different space operating systems that have been used. There's probably more that I have not been able to identify yet. Uh, a brand new one that I just discovered down at the bottom in the center is uh, MIT's come out with a new cyber hardened satellite software system where they, they've uh, gone in and engineered from the ground up for that operating system for uh, spacecraft to be secure from the very beginning. So that's a new, that's a new operating system that was just published. I don't know if it's going to be available in the open source like on GitHub or, or if it's only going to be... Uh, select organizations that have access to it, have no idea yet. But most of the satellites today that are being uh, flown are predominantly uh, Linux-based kernels. Like uh, SpaceX, SpaceX has its own Linux kernel for the rockets and its satellite systems. They, they have a, a hardened Linux kernel. Um, so mo most, th most things are converging on, uh, on a custom Linux kernel. But if we're going to, like I said, though, if we're going to go start doing threat hunting, though, if we're working for some organization that's got spacecraft assets, we've got to account for this. How are we going to go and do threat hunting, forensics, incident response in space? Uh, and then when uh, also we start looking at this, then there's uh, not only the operating system, but the command, the command languages to talk to the spacecraft. And because we're, a, lot, a lot of them are more of, a lot, a lot of the new ones are using Linux. Python is probably going to be an option. Uh, uh, the the CCS DS standard is probably what you're going to see primarily um, as a uh, command language on, on most of these satellites. It's a, it's a it's an international standard that a lot of a lot of the satellites use. But you need to be aware of these other uh, command languages depending on the satellites that you're. There's a lot of satellites that are that have been in orbit for a long time, legacy satellites that we may have to uh, deal with and have to go and be able to do threat hunting against. And along, also along that same line are the, pr the uh, protocols that the satellites might be using. Uh, predominantly, you're going to see the CCSDS 
space communication protocol that is an international standard and also uh, in Europe uh, there is uh, the European Cooperation for Space Standardization Packetization Standard ECSS uh, that is a protocol that is a standard that's used for a lot of satellites here in Europe that you may run into but there is a but there are a lot of protocols out there that you could encounter if you start working for an organization that has spacecraft assets in, that you need to help get monitoring visibility on. And of course, IP and IPv6 are out there. And uh, we have Web1, SpaceX with the Starlink network, and uh, Biosat, they're all running IP, and MPLS and all that. So, uh, so where are we at from a cybersecurity can standpoint in space? This is, I'm an old school Cisco guy. That's what I uh, grew up. Spent most of my career working on Cisco routers and, and uh, networking. So this really got my attention because I remember back when Cisco self-defending networks uh, came out in the early 2000s. So the first intrusion prevention system came out from a company I believe was called NetRanger. I believe they had the very first one Cisco bought them. Uh, and now everybody's got an intrusion prevention system. But, but Slingshot is a satellite that the Aerospace Corporation put up in September of 2022, and it has an intrusion prevention system capability on it. And so it's, con it's constantly monitoring and logging and looking for uh, unexpected commands, commands out of order. It's baselining all the data that's coming into it, any kind of commands uh, that are uh, uh, out of line of what's expected. It's utilizing machine learning to detect anomalies uh, in uh, activity on the spacecraft itself and any commands that are sent to it. So I think this is pretty interesting that where things are headed with a, with a uh, self-defending satellite. We've, we've had the self-defending networks where a firewall IDS can detect an attack and then the, then the firewall IDS can reconfigure it can uh, reconfigure the firewall or your router to respond to that attack. Well, now we're, we're looking at using that same kind of uh, concept for a satellite so that the satellite can defend itself, which is uh, the, um, here in Europe, a satellite was launched in uh, July of 2021. And similarly, it has a self-defending capability and it's using uh, software-defined radio so that if it starts detecting and uh, Someone messing with its frequencies, trying to jam the satellite. It's, it's inter, you know using the same frequencies, interfering with it. Uh, the satellite, the software-defined radio on the satellite can be reprogrammed dynamically to defend itself and jump to different frequencies so that it can keep operating and work through whether whether it's an it's accidental or intentional disruption to its communications. So I think it's really interesting to see where this is going to go. I'm, I'm really fascinated with the possibilities of a self-defending self spacecraft. But here are some, uh, some tools that are new. I, I know everybody knows about MITRE ATT&CK. And, you know, all through this presentation, we talked about machine learning and AI over and over again. So if you're interested in machine learning and AI, you also need to be looking at MITRE ATLAS because the machine learning AI are being targeted with what's called adversarial machine learning, where the machine learning and AI uh, algorithms and the data are, are being targeted. So you want to go and check out MITRE ATLAS if, if you're, follow, if you're uh, involved with machine learning uh, projects because your machine learning AI is going to be targeted as well. Uh, the European Space Agency, just uh, here a couple weeks ago, released SHIELD. Think of SHIELD as a space capability similar to MITRE ATT&CK. But it but came out of the U European Space Agency. It's brand new. There's Sparta. It's similar to it's similar to Mater Attack, but it came out of Aerospace Corporation. Uh, and a good friend of mine, uh, Dr. Jacob Oakley, he just uh, released this uh, framework called Trex. I encourage you to look at that. That's focused on uh, space space vehicles. Dr. Oakley is a true SME in cybersecurity, and he actually. He actually wrote the only book that I'm aware of on uh, space cybersecurity. So if you're interested in space satellite cybersecurity, you need to check out Dr. Oakley's book out on Amazon. It's a really good book. And also a uh, new tool 
that I'm uh, interested in that also has industrial control system plugins is uh, Modder's Caldera, which will aut help automate some of these frameworks for both blue team and red team testing. So we'll make sure those are on your radar. <laughs>